Uh, my name is Paul Gordevant, and I am with the University of Texas at Austin. And today we're going to talk about, thank you. Um, today we're going to talk about some human stuff. Uh, there will be almost no technical content to this conversation, so if that's not your cup of tea, you might want to head out and find something else. I will not be offended. Um, we're going to talk about some kind of project management ideas and some ideas of um, rhetoric and communication and some ideas of um, development policies for your team. Uh, I am a manager in the Central IT Group at the University of Texas here in Austin. Um, my team of uh, seven, um, not including myself, builds uh, Drupal distributions that other people at UT use to build websites. And we also build websites for people using that distribution and also not using that distribution. Um, I have been at UT Austin since about 2002, except for a brief sojourn in the private sector, which I will mention later in this talk. I've been using Drupal since about 2008 um, with Drupal 6. Uh, I am involved in some of the higher education um, community stuff with DrupalCon. I, uh, I've had the privilege of organizing a couple of the higher education summits at DrupalCon in 2016 and 2018. And that is my Drupal.org user ID. Uh, I don't do Twitter anymore, so that's probably the best place to find me on the web. <coughs> why this talk? Why, why did I... Um, why did I come up with this topic, and, and why are we talking about manifesto-driven development, whatever that turns out to mean? Uh, the first reason is I am a total sucker for a good manifesto, and uh, I was talking to my friend Ray yesterday and told him the title of this talk, and he basically said exactly the same thing. I don't know if anybody else feels the same way, but whenever I see something called a manifesto, I'm like, oh yeah, I am going to like this, because it it tells me it's going to be like strong opinions you know, expressed in interesting artful language and, and should be a fun read even if I don't agree with what it says. Um, for those of you who are familiar with some of the things we're going to be talking about, manifestos are actually a fairly common genre of writing or expression for um, sharing ideas in the software development industry these days and it could be useful to think about and understand why that is the case. And then uh, finally on uh, our team this year, we found, or really last year, we found that the process of writing our own manifesto was useful and interesting, and it could be useful for your team too. So our agenda today, I'm going to talk for a little while about manifestos, what they are, um, some historical manifestos you're probably all familiar with, but maybe have not thought of in that way, uh, and, and why they work as a genre. And then we'll talk about um, manifestos as they've evolved for expressions of uh, business and software thought. Uh, then we'll talk about when might your own team, if you are on or run a development team, why you meet, might need your own manifesto, how you go about making one of those, and, and what the benefits and potential challenges of that process are. So first, let's talk about what manifestos are. Can anybody identify this, uh, this image, who that represents? Sir. Martin Luther. So that's Martin Luther nailing the 95 theses to the door of the church, uh, his indictment of the Catholic Church that started the Protestant Reformation. Um, just a, a general definition, a manifesto, which comes from, uh, event, uh, originally from the Latin for to make something public or obvious, is a published verbal or written declaration of the intentions, motives, or views of the issuer. Uh, that could be an individual, a group, a political party, or a government. Um, it usually accepts a previously published opinion or public consensus, or most of the ones I'm going to discuss today promotes a new idea with prescriptive notions for carrying out changes the author believes should be made. And that's, that's what I think is fun about manifestos, is the idea of uh, new ideas with prescriptive notions, because those prescriptive notions give us something to kind of wrestle with and push against sometimes. There's all kinds of manifestos throughout uh, history, and, and, uh, and today we see them for religious and spiritual causes. We see them uh, in politics all the time. Uh, some of the best examples are from the world of art and culture. 
And then in the you know, latter half, latter part of the 20th century and early part of the 21st, we're seeing them more uh, for uh, purposes having to do with business, technology, and even personal manifestos. I've seen in the course of researching this, I saw people talk about the, the benefits of writing your own manifesto. Even if you don't publish it anywhere, you just kind of like keep a note on your phone and read your own manifesto every day to remind yourself of your personal missions in life. So why do manifestos work, if they work at all? Um, some thoughts on that. One, I think, is that strong opinions and simple storylines are very attractive in a complex world, right? Um, manifestos sort of seek to simplify a world full of messy problems into a short and digestible set of principles or solutions. Uh, as we'll see with some of these examples, this can work both in favor of and against the cause of manifesto writers, since the simplicity of a manifesto solution might sometimes be outstripped by the complexity of the problem it tries to solve. Second, uh, manifestos challenge and provoke their audience by design. Um, oh, I'm having trouble with my notes here. Um, so as, as Julia Hanna from the Atlantic Magazine put it, any manifesto worth reading demands the impossible. And what could be more fun than that, right? So while that's often impractical, it provides the reader or listener with a greater sense of emotional investment than just a policy prescription or an instruction manual. And then uh, finally, depending on the eloquence of the author, manifestos can sometimes just feel like magic. The form allows and encourages a looseness or sort of madness uh, in the writing form that other genres don't, as the author attempts to bring a new reality into existence through their sheer force of will. In terms of benefits, manifestos can serve as a statement of principles or a bold call to action, or both. Um, they're usually short, you know, readable enough to, to review often, um, and, to, and that shortness and that uh, re-readability helps reinforce the priorities and provide inspiration. And finally, they allow the group or the self who's writing it to actually communicate with their future self uh, across time. Like, I'm projecting who I want to be through this document, or who I want you to be, if I'm you know, telling other people how they should behave. So moving on to some uh, well-known historical examples. Uh, I think this. Uh, Charlton Heston handing down the stone tablets on Mount Sinai is probably the most OG of manifestos. Um, it, in, a, in a very real sense, it provides the template for many other manifestos throughout history uh, in terms of the format. You, you know, many manifestos you'll read use that numbered, you know, especially 10 seems to be a magic number that a lot of people use, um, list of commands or, or um, prescriptions. Uh, as well as, you know, just providing a moral foundation and guide for living in the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, which is a pretty big, um, pretty big thing to happen in something in such a small package. Um, according to scholars, the Ten Commandments uh, appeared as early as the 14th century BCE in the Mesopotamian and Hittite laws and treaties. Uh, it is unique among other biblical laws in that these these uh, commandments were broadly written with room for interpretation. They didn't say like, you know, uh, cook your meat to a temperature of 160 degrees every day. They were uh, more broadly applicable than that. Um, so they were meant to apply universally across varying circumstances, a characteristic which we see throughout many manifesto examples. Number two, uh, one that we're also probably all pretty familiar with, the Declaration of Independence. Um, the Declaration of Independence, if you haven't read it in a while, opens by setting the context, right? This is, this is the comp part of the context setting of the Declaration of Independence, which you see in a lot of manifesto style documents. And then it goes on to list 27 reasons or grievances against the King of England about why the U.S. intends to create their own independent republic. So the king has maintained standing armies among the colonies without consent of their legislatures, or he has imposed taxes on the people without their consent. And for the big emotional finish, you know, the clip declares, these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, 
that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. So sitting 250 years down the road from that statement, we think, well, yeah, of course, that, that's what happened. But if you think about the context of the time in which these guys were writing that, that was pretty revolutionary stuff. So again, communicating across time uh, between our past and future selves. Next up, a little uh, closer to contemporary American history, is the uh, I Have a Dream speech from um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., delivered at the March on Washington on August 28, 1963. If you review it again, there's a, there's a context-setting portion at the beginning of the speech where he talks about the abolition of slavery, uh, which was decreed by the Emancipation Proclamation as acting as a beacon of light to millions of slaves and an end to captivity, but then stating that 100 years later, we must face the fact that African Americans are still not free due to pervasive discrimination and segregation. So as the speech moves towards its emotional climax, Dr. King repeats the phrase, I have a dream, while listing numerous examples of his vision of racial equality that our nation will uphold its creed that all men are created equal, that one day the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will sit together at a table of brotherhood, that his children will live in a nation where they are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Again, these were not real things at the time he said them. These were, this was a manifesto for a future that he wanted to see made real and that he believed we could work towards making real. Um, yeah. So next, moving out of the world of politics, uh, this is one I did not really know anything about before I started researching this presentation. The uh, Manifesto of Futurism was written by the Italian poet Filippo Tommaso Marinetti um, and published in, uh, as a newspaper advertisement in 1908. So instead of being a moral political movement, the Manifesto of Futurism expressed an artistic philosophy that was a rejection of the past and a celebration of characteristics that were seen as modern, speed, machinery, violence, youth, industry. Um, this, this document is recognized today as revolutionary for the fact that it actually preceded the creation or existence of any art that was influenced by it. So rather than you know, there being futurist artists, and after a few years they got together and said, hey guys, we need to write this document that sort of um, describes what we're doing. This guy manifested this out of his head, and it then influenced a whole future movement of art and subsequent manifestos to apply these ideas to painting, music, and literature. Um, and, and even more importantly, perhaps, the Manifesto of Futurism changed the status of art from a discipline of creative expression to being an agent of social and political change. A later example of artistic movements defined through manifestos, um, I don't know, is anybody, is anybody familiar with this one, Dogma 95? Just one? Okay. So the, um, this is a filmmaking movement established in 1995 by the Danish directors Lars von Trier and Thomas Vintenberg with the intent of taking power away from film studios and putting it back in the hands of directors at art as artists. And they actually wrote a manifesto document um, which included a, a set of 10 rules that they called the vow of chastity, which was intended to enforce the traditional values of story, acting, and theme over special effects or technology. Uh, the dogma collective believed that this approach would better engage the audience since it, they would not then feel alienated by overproduction. Between 1998 and 2002, 31 films were verified by the original Dogma 95 board. So if you submitted your film to the Dogma 95 board, you could get this certificate, which was then actually placed uh, in the beginning credits of the movies to show that you um, had complied with the rules of the manifesto. Um, eventually, the, the founders sort of moved on from their extreme position on, on these ideas and uh, it officially demanded and disbanded in 2005. 
So as a final example, in this section, um, this is one I came across towards the end of, of my research and thought to include it just because it, um, I, I'm going to try not to make commentary on it, but I think it, in a lot of ways it demonstrates where we have ended up with manifestos in 2018 as a thing. Um, this is called the Holsty Manifesto. Has anybody ever seen this before? I had seen it on the web somewhere like, you know, Facebook or something like that. People were like, oh, this is so inspiring. You know, read this. It's awesome. So I did a little research on it to figure out uh, what it was. And, and the Holstein Manifesto is a statement of values written in 2009 uh, by two brothers, Mike and Dave uh, Radparvar, who had co-founded a t-shirt company called Holstein. And the, their idea with this company was to focus on mitigating the environmental and social impacts of clothing production. And they sat down together and wrote this document to sort of codify their business ideals. And they published it on Tumblr, and it went viral. People loved it, right? So then they started offering, offering a nicely designed, like, letterpress, letterpress printed version of this as a poster on the Holsty company website. And then it quickly became their best-selling product. So uh, eventually, the Holstein Manifesto got so popular, especially in relation to their t-shirt business, that it seems to have become the entire rationale for the business itself now. If you go to the Holstein website, there is nothing about clothing. Um, you, and you cannot find any evidence of their original mission as a clothing company. Instead, the front and center mission statement on the, on the homepage says, we help you along your journey to live more fully and mindfully. And you can follow a call to action at the bottom there to join a daily reflections mailing list in order to start the day feeling grounded and inspired. You can still buy things, but what you can buy is many different products inspired by the manifesto, including posters, frames, letterpress stationery, and coffee mugs. And finally, you get to the real meat of their new revenue model, which is what's called the Holstein Membership, which is available in either print or digital versions at different price points and includes printable monthly action guides, inspirational art, monthly curated resources, access to the Reflections Archive, and membership in a private digital community. So, like I said, I'm a sucker for manifestos, so I signed up for the mailing list, and this morning <laughs> I received my Welcome to June, a month of adventure introductory email, uh, and I'm sure that I will be growing into a better person throughout the years as I, as I continue to receive these inspiring messages. So, looking back on some of these examples, what makes a manifesto successful? Um, number one, it resonates with people and it expresses principles that the audience shares with the author. Number two, it's simple and concise. For, for uh, full disclosure, I tried rereading the Communist Manifesto as part of my research for this presentation because I figured when you say manifesto, that's probably, for a lot of people, that's the first thing that comes to their mind. That thing is impenetrable. I do not understand how it has affected human history to the degree that it did. Regardless of your politics, it is, is like hard reading. I, I don't know how it took off, but... There must be like a Cliff Notes version of it somewhere that I that I missed. Um, a good manifesto is created by a group of people from different organizations who may compete, but who share the same values and principles. And I think we'll see more examples of that in some of the kind of business and technology examples we'll get to next. And then uh, finally, the manifesto is backed by a community where people can share ideas and experiences about how they've actually applied the ideas in the manifesto in their actual context. Hence the uh, Holsty Manifesto digital membership community that I'm now apparently a member of. So, moving along from history uh, into the now, uh, let's talk about how manifestos have developed as a communication tool for business and software. The first one I want to talk about chronologically is a, a document called the Clue Train Manifesto. Um, it, it's a good transition, I think, to what we might today call the Business Manifesto or Technology Manifesto, and certainly was an inspiration for some of the other works we're going to discuss. 
This was originally posted to the web in March 1999 as a set of 95 theses, echoing uh, Martin Luther's format from the 16th century, um, which was a, a conscious decision on the author's part. It was later published as a book under the same title, which extended the original 95 theses with seven additional long-form essays. And it is viewed today by many as a foundational text of the internet age. Um, the basic theme of Clue Train is examining the impact of the internet on marketing and essentially making the claim that conventional marketing techniques have been made obsolete by the online conversations that consumers have and that companies need to join. And this was 20 years ago, so I think, you know, especially for folks in the room who are young enough that you were, you know, kids or high school age when this came out, you probably wouldn't even recognize the context that these guys were pushing against. But at the time when there was no such thing as digital marketing, this was uh, pretty revolutionary thinking. Next up, uh, who who is not on my team in this room can identify our, our next manifesto from this image. Agile. The Agile Manifesto, yes. So um, this was probably my uh, entree into technology manifestos as a, as a format of writing. Um, the Agile Manifesto was written in 2001. Uh, in the 90s, uh, there was no such thing as, as agile software development, and a, this set of new methodologies were evolving in response to the heavyweight methods that were being criticized by people as being overly planned or regulated. These methodologies collectively became known as agile software development. In 2001, a group of 17 software developers met at a resort in Snowbird, Utah to discuss these methods and eventually uh, ended up publishing the Manifesto for Agile Software Development. And you know, going back to our historical examples and talking about context setting, this is the context setting for the Agile Manifesto. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. This is the first page of the web version of the Manifesto. Um, and, and this is an interesting one as, as manifestos go because it uses a rhetorical strategy or a device that, for lack of a better term, I'll call a, a continuum of values, which I think does a neat trick. So let's, let's look at these uh, four lines here. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, etc. What I think this does that's, that's pretty, pretty smart is they establish a clear position for the manifesto, right? We are about individuals and interactions. We are about working software. What they do not do is show any type of like dogmatism or ideological rigidity by saying we reject processes and tools. We reject comprehensive documentation. So they show flexibility that goes a long way towards showing credibility because they're not going to alienate their readers who may be coming to this document from an entire career of professional software development that took place on the right side of that continuum. If you take somebody whose entire career has been based on processes and tools and comprehensive documentation and contract negotiation and you tell them all that is wrong, you've probably lost that person right then. Instead, this says, there's a balance between these things, and maybe we should you know, shift a little more to this other side. Once that's been established, the Agile Manifesto goes on to lay out a, a series of 12 specific principles <coughs> stated in clear, brief language, easily understood by anybody with any technical level of expertise at all. There's, there's nothing really specific to software development in here at all um, from a technical perspective. Nothing about version control, nothing about continuous integration. Uh, instead, the principles focus more on factors related to human behavior, environment, group dynamics. These serve as a framework which could be and have been used as the foundation of any number of technical implementations that you could then call Agile. Four years after the Agile Manifesto, a second group of experts worked together to develop a companion manifesto to establish project management principles that would be needed 
to achieve an agile mindset in product and project management. And this is called the Declaration of Interdependence. And it established six principles that the authors felt were essential to modern project management. Uh, there's, there's some kind of cool stuff going on with the uh, language and structure here. The title about interdependence refers to the fact that project team members are part of an interdependent whole rather than a group of unconnected individuals. Similarly, project teams, customers and stakeholders are also interdependent. And the authors argue that project teams who do not recognize this interdependence are unlikely to be successful. And then finally, the six principles themselves, which are all stated as a, uh, a clause that, a, a combination of clauses that, uh, that establish intent and then action. So we increase return on investment, that's the intent. We make a continuous flow of value our focus, that's the action. All six of those principles actually also demonstrate the concept of interdependence because they all stand alone, yet they all work together to develop a comprehensive system of values for project management. Moving on to uh, more contemporary and, and very different in the sense of being far more specific and technical uh, document, there's something called the 12-factor app, um, which establishes an opinionated methodology for developing software-as-a-service applications. Written by developers working at Heroku, this was originally published in 2011 with the stated motivation of raising awareness of problems in modern application development, providing a shared vocabulary for discussing these problems, and offering a set of solutions. It breaks down SaaS application development, uh, which in 2011 was a, a pretty new discipline, into 12 specific technical design factors, and then offers detailed opinion, which is, those are all links to much more detailed uh, articles behind each one on how each factor should be managed. And then a final example, uh, sort of also in the vein of the 12-factor app, maybe a little more applicable for us as Drupalists, um, is a group of developers that call themselves the League of Extraordinary Packages, <laughs> which demonstrates an outstanding commitment to the you know, dramatic flair of uh, manifestos. Um, this group has banded together to establish a modern standards-based collection of PHP packages that conform to an opinionated definition of quality, which just fits manifestos to a T. So on their web page, the definition of quality section is essentially the manifesto. They've established 10 um, criteria for what they say defines an awesome PHP package. Uh, everything from using namespaces, to using a coding style guide, to using packages, to writing unit tests, and, and so on. So I think this is a good one because it's, it's pretty lightweight, but it also encapsulates a lot of the sort of um, modern PHP practices that we've all started to learn and develop through working with Drupal 8. Um, a lot of these are things that, that we've had to sort of move on to as part of that transition. So, why do people write these things, right? What, what are people's motivations for writing business and software development manifestos? And I think these are, these are some that make sense to me. People like to challenge the status quo. People find it useful to establish a shared understanding of best practices. Uh, all of these can, can serve in that way. Some people really like to end what doesn't work, right? So think of the Agile manifesto in that way. People are looking at, at traditional waterfall, heavyweight project management, software development, and say, this does not work anymore. We need a better way. People like to inspire community, uh, and definitely some, some of these have, have done that. I mean, uh, there's a whole industry based around uh, the, what the Agile Manifesto started. Some people, I think, just do it to get some social media cred. You know, the, they want to heighten their own profile in the software development community. And then some people just do it for fun. And I'll show uh, one example of somebody who did a manifesto just for fun. This is a sort of a riff on the Agile manifesto called the Manifesto for half arsed Agile Software Development, which looks pretty legit if you don't read the words very closely. But first you notice the background is all like 
old white dudes from the 50s, and then you see, like, <laughs> we have heard about new ways of developing software by paying consultants and reading Gartner reports. Through this, we have been told to value individuals and interactions over process and tools, and we have mandatory processes and tools to control how those indiv individuals, uh, we prefer the term resources, interact. So this is, you know, this, it's, a, it's a farce um, and a pretty enjoyable one as that goes. Um, so last section before we start talking about um, an actual case study of, uh, of our team developing a manifesto is some examples that come from the world of Drupal, since we're at Texas Camp. I said I was going to talk about my brief foray away from UT. In 2014, I left UT to work as a technical account manager at Acquia. This job ended up only lasting nine months, as I quickly learned that I am not personally cut out for a full-time uh, remote work lifestyle. But during this brief period, I learned more about Drupal than I had during my entire web development career to that time, thanks to the extremely smart people on my team and the wide range of problems I was asked to solve by my customers on any given day. At some point during that nine months, I was exposed to my first manifesto that was specifically written for Drupal, and it completely changed my perspective about how to manage Drupal sites at the enterprise level. And this, this document is called the D-Cycle Manifesto. It was written by a Canadian a developer named Albert Albala. I had to look him up because I, I had actually never figured out the name of the person who was responsible for this, and he doesn't uh, he doesn't really publicize himself very well on the website. So I kind of had to go poking around for it. But uh, he specializes in automated testing and continuous integration for Drupal projects. The manifesto and the blog that also exist on that site define a philosophical and practical approach for defining a dev stage production workflow for Drupal development with detailed implementation advice for deployment, test coverage, and continuous integration. You probably can't read it, but the first line under the title says, D-Cycle is a building code for Drupal. And that's, that's a great you know, one sentence takeaway of, of what's going on there. Uh, while we do not follow all of the principles of the D-Cycle Manifesto, our team at UT has successfully adopted many of them, especially regarding configuration management and um, deployment for complex or high visibility sites. It's been super helpful. Highly recommend it. A uh, second example I found is called something called the Drupal Site Builder Manifesto. Uh, this was written by a British gentleman named Darren Mother Seal in 2015, with um, a stated goal of clarifying what is actually meant by the term site builder in the Drupal community, so that people using that term in conversation can start from a point of agreement about what it means. So again, hard to read some of these, uh, but things like, uh, we are usually the ones to take ownership of the final product. We don't just click and configure websites. We have knowledge of all the areas involved in building a Drupal website. We work with the rest of the team to ensure everyone is doing what they do best and contributing to the project in a meaningful way. We may not all know how to write optimal PHP code, but we know when to build something using Drupal core or contributed modules and when we need a custom plugin or custom module created. That's a pretty good definition of a, a site builder, I think. And then the final example of a Drupal-specific manifesto comes from David Huang, who um, is currently the director of web strategy at uh, DocuSign in San Francisco. In 2014, he authored this document, uh, which you can find on GitHub, called Horseman, a manifesto about the future of Drupal. And this, um, from what I can tell, was sort of an extension of discussion about headless Drupal that was taking place on uh, groups.drupal.org and other places in the community and at DrupalCon events and things like that. And in just four bullet points there, he really manages to make a pretty revolutionary statement about the position of Drupal as a CMS and the future that Drupal should bend towards in order to what he says is to avoid becoming irrelevant. Right? We want Drupal to be the preferred back-end content management system for designers and front-end developers. 
very specific there. Um, we believe that client-side front-end frameworks are the future of the web. It is critically important for Drupal to be services-oriented first, not HTML-oriented first, or risk becoming irrelevant. That is big stuff. And uh, I think a, a manifesto was a great sort of format for uh, stating some of those, those principles. As a sort of fun little follow-up side note to that, um, this was a little tweet storm that David wrote at the end of DrupalCon Nashville this year, four years after he wrote the Horseman Manifesto, and he's basically still saying the same thing. When the new front end eats the web, and it's not a question of if, but rather of when, the one thing that makes Drupal relevant when everything else is better will still be the core of content management, that we aren't racing to make Drupal the best content backend and API available at the expense of all other concerns worries me greatly. It is the only chance out there for staying truly relevant in the next two to five years. So points to David for staying on message for four years since he wrote the, the Horseman Manifesto. And we'll all see where that discussion goes. So how do these business software manifestos measure up to our you know, more sort of high-minded uh, cultural historical manifestos? Are they resonant? Are they simple? Are they originated by groups with shared values? Are they backed by community? I think yes. I think, I think all of those things. I think these things are worthy of calling themselves manifestos, both in terms of how they're written and the type of effect that they um, strive to have and, and that many of them end up do having. So final part. Your team may need a manifesto. So if you are part of a team or you manage a team, there are some conditions that your team may find themselves in that suggest maybe you need something like this. Um, if your team is new or has recently been reorganized, if your team has been told or, or has determined to make a shift in direction, if your team is adopting a new technology or a new project management methodology, or if your team is taking on an extremely large project, you know, maybe sitting down to engage in this exercise could be useful. Last year, our team found ourselves in this position. Uh, we were starting work on uh, rebuilding our well-established Drupal 7 campus distribution in Drupal 8. And uh, we call that UTDK8 for UT Drupal Kit 8, because I'll say that again later, so just so you don't know the shorthand. Uh, we were adding three new members to our core development team who had not previously participated in the development or sustainment of the Drupal 7 version of the distribution. Because this was Drupal 8, we had quite a bit of uncertainty about how to proceed with many of the new technology choices in, oh, that's a typo, in D8. Uh, Composer, the configuration management initiative, the new layout tools in Drupal 8, um, the base theme options available in Drupal 8. And then we were also planning to, uh, as opposed to our Drupal 7 uh, development cycle where we were working with a sort of central group of people who were kind of dictating what was going to happen. This time we wanted to bring in our stakeholders a lot earlier to get their feedback. So it would be useful to have something that they could react to that wasn't actually like developed software. So we decided to write a manifesto. Um, the goals of this document would be to serve as a vehicle for defining and working through these critical technology decisions getting the whole team, which included people who had not worked on the Drupal 7 distribution, aligned on uh, this project um, to sort of provide a, a common internal guidepost for team standards and design decisions, and then to distill all of this down into something very manageable for our stakeholders so that we could present it to them and get feedback. So. Through our process, I have a few recommendations if you choose to do this on your own. The first, I would say, is pick a collaborative writing tool. 
Um, this may be second nature for a lot of people given the prevalence of things like Google Docs, but it was important for us in this process because we wanted to be able to do interactive you know, commentary and suggestions as the document was under, underway. Uh, Google Docs would work fine for this. We actually chose to do a lot of the authoring of the document in GitHub as a markdown document so that we could then use the pull request process to make suggestions and get feedback on the suggestions as it was going. And that worked out pretty well. And those are two tools that I think everybody has access to. Second thing I would advise is that you set some ground rules for your manifesto. Um, pick a structure and look back at some of these other manifestos like the Agile Manifesto or um, 12 factor app, if you're writing a more technical document, and sort of pick a, a rhetorical style that you like and try to make your document fit to that because then that enforces a certain consistency of thought across all the different factors you're trying to think about. So it could be 10 commandments style, it could be that Agile manifesto sort of this over that, like I don't want to reject that but I want to emphasize this, uh, or it could be more like that um, uh, declaration of interdependence, like, so that this, we will do that. And then uh, a second tip that came in, in handy, and we didn't, we didn't think about this at first, but I would strongly advise that you set some definitions for tricky words, like, what does should mean? What does will mean? What does must mean? So if you say, the distribution should do this, that, and the other, or the distribution will do this, that, and the other. And what we found was, uh, you know, through different people's writing styles and even the same person um, over time, they would use different words and kind of all mean the same thing, but we couldn't really figure out, well, is that like declared, is that imperative, or is that sort of conditional or what? So uh, what we landed on um, is this, which Hopefully a lot of people have seen this. This is RFC 2119. Um, RFCs are a re request for comments, and these are the documents that come out of the Internet Engineering Task Force that define the standards for everything we use on the Internet, from the web to email to DNS. Um, they're fairly dry technical documents, but they, they're written very well, and they all reference this sort of meta RFC about what keywords mean. So um, if you go to 2119, you can see, well, what does it mean when we say must or must not or required? And that gives you an actual like, common point of agreement and definition about those words. Uh, a final tip I would recommend is, at least when you're getting started, probably give one person the responsibility of getting the first draft down on paper. Um, it makes things happen faster, and it also keeps things pretty consistent if it's coming out of the same person's head. And then once you have everything uh, in one person's voice and, and down on paper, then it's time to start getting feedback from other people and making revisions. That, that could be a, your mileage may vary for sure, but I thought that was a, a success factor for us. So uh, here's the introduction to our manifesto that we ended up writing. Uh, the following page provides a highly opinionated prescription for building a Drupal 8 distribution. It is designed to be a straw man, to be disputed, contradicted, ridiculed, and subsequently revised. In effect, a, and this is French, so I'm not going to attempt to say it, um, which will eventually grow into a blueprint for an actual distribution design document. That phrase in French, uh, reculaire pour mieux sauter, I don't know. Um, what that actually means, we, we uh, all got sent to the dictionary to look that up by the person who wrote it. Um, it literally means to draw back in order to leap better. So um, pulling back in order to improve one's chances of subsequent progress or success. And uh, that's a good way to think about what you're doing here. You're sort of stopping, take a step back, look at the big picture, write it all down, and then you can move forward. This is what it looks like in GitHub. Uh, it's in a, our enterprise GitHub instance at UT, so I can't give you guys the URL to look at it, but 
Uh, it's basically just a markdown document. There's an introduction I showed you. There's the reference to RFC 2119 for the keyword definitions. And then we start into the actual text. It's about two pages. Um, the outline is we talk about uh, composer, configuration management, content, layout and content placement, custom functionality, the theme, and then at the end we kind of roll it all up into Ten Commandments similar to the Ten Commandments. Uh, in terms of format, within each section of that outline I just showed you, um, there are guidelines, and then the guidelines are followed by reasoning. So this was an example of one of the guidelines. Non-functional example files may be provided for gitignore, circle.yaml, pantheon.yaml, as part of the distribution, and then we tell you why. And so we kind of did that for each piece in each of those uh, sections of the, uh, of the manifesto. These are the actual Ten Commandments. I am not going to take the time to read through them. The slides will be available, and if you, if you so choose, you can uh, pull this down and take a look. Shameless plug time. If you want to learn more about our project and the actual technical architecture that has evolved out of this manifesto, uh, attend tomorrow's session, Drupal Distro for the win, 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. in Magnolia B. So, lessons learned from our manifesto journey. <coughs> Keep in mind, a manifesto is not a design document. Uh, we have a thing at UT in our central IT department as part of our um, project methodology called a design blueprint document. And anybody who's ever had to write a design blueprint document in ITS knows that this is like, it's like a book. Like, they want you to document every technical detail of every single thing you're going to build down to, down to every, every, you know, it's almost like the actual thing itself, but it's just a, it's a design document. And that is not what you want to do with this. Um, you don't want to get down in the weeds on every technical decision. You don't really want to talk about implementation, you know, choices down to like this field versus that field or this content type versus that content type. This is broad strokes. Um, in order to help us, again, pull back to move forward. You may still need a design document. Kind of depends what your project process is. If you're doing an agile process, maybe you move forward from your manifesto into writing user stories. If you're doing a waterfall process, maybe you move forward from your manifesto into writing a design blueprint. But either way, the manifesto has helped you sort of clarify some major technical choices before you move forward. Second thing I would say is um, looking back at all the manifestos we've talked about in the last 45 minutes, um, you kind of have to keep in mind that this is a format that encourages or lends itself to absolutist interpretation, right? With the exception of the Agile manifesto, everything else we've looked at is basically like, this is the right way to do it, right? So if you're writing a document for your team or your project that takes the form of this is the right way to do it, think about the impact that that will have the first time you need to have a discussion about, well, is that the right way to do it? Right? Like, and then if some people are like, but the manifesto says that's the way we have to do it, who can argue with the manifesto? So. My, my position there would be your manifesto should include everything it needs to answer the problem it's trying to solve and not one thing more. Because if you put things in there that don't need to be in there, then you've created the situation where you've made um, sort of absolutist statements about things that don't require an absolutist <laughs> statement. So just leave those things unanswered to be discussed during sprint planning or during the writing design blueprint if you have to go through that process. The manifesto is a big picture document. So that's really it. Um, again, this is for people who want to download the slides. I've got links to everything from uh, the Ten Commandments to the Holstein Manifesto and all of the technical manifestos, uh, including the ones for Drupal and even a link to RFC 2119, if you want to use that when you write your manifesto. So uh, with that, we have about 10 minutes left. 
if anybody has any questions, happy to entertain them. I hope that was useful, interesting. Yes, sir? You have a mechanism for uh, kind of doing a retrospective on your manifesto, what's working about it, what isn't, in order to amend it? That's a great question. Um, we have not done that, and we probably should, because we've been living with it and developing with it for six months plus. And um, actually, I was, I was talking to Mark about it the other day because I told him that I was going to include the Ten Commandments, and that provoked this, like, oh, is all that still right? Like, have we changed any of that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's definitely a good idea if it's a... If it's going to be a long-running project, or if it's something that's like permanent for your team, yeah. then that would definitely be a good idea. Cool, continuously improving. Yeah, exactly. Yes. How much friction did you encounter between team members, and how much friction do you think is is you know useful or possible in writing these manifestos? Mm. While the team is in here, um, I I don't recall much friction. I'm getting a Shaking head. <laughs> Safe space. Uh, no, I mean, part of it was it was we did sort of have that thing where one person sort of put most of the words on the page to start with, and that person was kind of in the primary architect role. So it, that was, um, you know, in a sense, the the right place to be getting those opinions um, the first time around. And I would say it was a productive process of refinement, um, but we didn't really have any friction about it. Sir? Based on your answer, I think I might know the answer to this question, but I was wondering if there was, if you had any experience where there were like objections to the concept of a manifesto in general that I, I did not get that from anybody. Um, uh, uh, that it, I will acknowledge the possibility that some people felt that way and didn't feel comfortable saying anything about it because I was so enthusiastic. Um, <laughs> but they they also would not have been unfamiliar with that uh, enthusiasm because I'm always like, hey guys, look at this new manifesto I found. So I'm sure there was uh, internal dialogue of like, oh God, we're gonna now we're gonna write our own. It's, yeah. How often has uh, have you gone to the manifesto to settle a disagreement? Not, not. We haven't had to do it that many times. I was thinking about that as as I was writing it, um, and I think that probably is mostly due to the fact that we spent enough time on it, and everybody sort of internalized that, and then it drove a lot of framework decisions we made very early on. That um, I can't recall any instances coming up where we've had to sort of refer back. And say, oh, but you said that. Anybody, can anybody think of that? I remember it happening, but it was yeah. it was mostly when when we will think about like doing things in one way, like personally thinking of doing something in some way, and then not being sure to talk to someone else from the team, and then that person saying, oh no, it's mm. this other way, mm. and then if we were not getting anywhere between us, we were like, oh, let's just. Look at the Ten Commandments. We all we wrote, and, and the answer was in there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like okay, we're just doing that. Yes. Um, I should be a fairly you know, from a project management s step in your process. Uh, can you tell me about how much time you would suggest you might anticipate spending on a manifesto, mm. or how you might calculate like this is going to take us? We need to set aside. I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, a lot of it was um, asynchronous time. So, like, the first draft took however long the first draft took. We kind of met and talked about it together and then gave people a period of time to sort of think and, and submit revisions. I would say overall the process probably took three to four weeks, maybe, from kind of beginning to end, but could have been done faster, for sure. We were yeah, doing other things. things. Were doing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. Was there a need uh, to get buy in from any other folks inside of the university? Was it primarily internal to your team? And, and uh, if there wasn't a, a need, how would you have approached it? If yeah. You needed to? Well, 
this was sort of a case of uh, we're gonna we're gonna put it together and then get the buy-in uh, at the back end, and so we wrote it leading up to our first uh, customer steering committee meeting, um, and then presented it as part of that meeting, and we were open to feedback but didn't get any that suggested we need. Well, no, actually, that's not true. We did get feedback uh, about the the theme. Right? Um, the, no, like at that meeting, right? or after that meeting about Bootstrap. So actually we did, um, the, the Ten Commandments kind of, uh, that we presented to the Customer Steering Committee actually provoked a response <laughs> from somebody that ended up changing our, our minds and direction about one of those things. So that actually ended up being very useful. Um, and wasn't contentious, it was a very productive like exchange of ideas. And uh, and I would say worked as as well as I could have hoped. And we wouldn't have needed a Ten Commandments in order to get that feedback, but sure, it was an engaging way to do it at least. Yeah. <coughs> Is there somebody over there? Mark. Thanks for this interesting presentation. It's a novel idea. <laughs> What would you say is the difference in the genre of the manifesto as compared to a, a mission statement and a vision that an organization might have? What mm -hmm. different roles would those two genres play? Or other kinds of ways of organizing your thoughts for clarity? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think, you know, in comparison to your sort of like standard corporate mission and vision it's it's not too different um, if I think about the the mission and values that we had at Acquia just because it, it was a very specific example it was kind of similar in in format um, to that but just maybe feels expressed with a little less um, oomph maybe like a little less yeah we're gonna do this and that just all depends on the organization. Um, in some cases, it may be a lot, a mission or vision might be a lot more high-minded, like the mission of the University of Texas is to change lives for the benefit of society. Um, that's great, uh, and it makes me feel good about going to work, but it doesn't give me something very actionable. It doesn't necessarily shape my behavior. I, I think that's a key difference. Yeah. It's, it's not a policy, it's something that's actionable. Yeah. So I've seen both kinds, I think. Um, and then in terms of others, I think I think part of it was it was just kind of fun. You know, it was a little more fun to do this than to say we're going to write a design document for the for the distribution. It was a little more fun to say, yeah, we're going to write a manifesto and it got everybody really kind of engaged. I, I don't think you could do it all the time. That would probably get weird. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, you know, for a you know once a year type of uh, type of thing, it worked out pretty well. Team building. Yeah, yeah, team building. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you guys so much for coming. And <laughs>